Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today I'm joined by a man whose musical talent, persistent drive, and infectious attitude has opened up adventures worldwide, including being a number one billboard charting country artist and the host of the Sportsman Channel's hit show, Hogue Wild. Welcome to the Silvercore Podcast, Lucas Hogue. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's awesome. So, you know, we've been talking back and forth for for a while here, and I'm so glad we're able to make this one connect. But before we even get rolling, yesterday, you were what, Grand Old Opry? Yeah, man. I just I, every time I get invited to play the Opry, it's just like a it, it's just an honor all over again, you know. And uh, it was a great lineup. My buddy Craig Morgan was playing. Gary Lavox showed up. Uh, Travis Denning, Drew Baldridge, <laughs> you name it. It was just a bunch of great, great people. Megan Patrick from up there. She's a Canadian up there who's killing yeah. it. And oh. uh, so it was great. It was great to fun to to share the stage with everybody and finally hang out backstage without COVID <laughs> restrictions, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so, man. That's been a few years. That's a hell of an accomplishment being uh, being asked and reinvited back to uh, play at the Opry. That's uh, you know, not thanks. many people can put that feather in their cap. That's oh, good. thanks, man. Yeah, I had my Opry debut back in 2017, <laughs> and uh, I, I got to debut at the Ryman Auditorium, which is the original uh, Grand Old Opry. So it's the mother church of country music. So it was really cool that wow. night. And then wow. I've been invited back for probably eight or nine maybe 10 different times now. So, and last night was really cool because it was kind of uh, double. It was, uh, we were benefiting conservation aid for NWTF, which is the national Turkey, uh, wild Turkey Federation here in the States. And, and uh, okay. man, it was just cool. We were raising money for conservation, getting to play country music. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when I'm looking at all the different things you've done, so you're, you're a musician, you're an avid outdoorsman, you're philanthropic, you do a lot of charity work, you're an yeah. entrepreneur. I mean, <laughs> you've got your own TV show and this isn't your first, Hogue Wild. Uh, no. You've done work with NASCAR and Sunday Night Football and I'm looking at all these different avenues where we can kind of go. But yeah. from my perspective, when I look at you and the accomplishments and the drive that you have, I'm selfishly kind of looking at it and wondering, you know, like what, what do you define as success in your life? Like if you were to say, look, this is what Good. success is, what, what would that be? Well, that's a great question. Cause I get that question quite a bit and, and it's different for everybody, right? You know, it kind of stemmed uh, back a few years when, you know, you're out there touring and this is before the TV show, but you're touring, you're, you're grinding like crazy and you're having a lot of success, what you feel is success, right? And you have everybody coming up to the autograph line or whatever. And they're like, man, I can't wait till you make it, or I can't wait till this happens for you. And I'm like, I'm successful at exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm a, you know, I might not be the biggest country music star in the world like Garth Brooks, but man, I have been able to do this, you know, for my basically most of my life and not have to pound nails uh, as a contractor anymore. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, that's what I did to support my music habit until the music took off. And to me, that's what success is all about. Being able to do what you love every single day and make a living at it. And to me, that's success. I don't care what industry you're in, as long as you love what you're doing and that's the dream that you've been striving for, to me, that's success. I love that definition. You know, it, it's not the actual achieving of the goal, it's a process of loving what you're doing as you yeah. work towards different goals. I, exactly. I do enjoy that. Exactly. Now, you've got a bit of a family background, I think, with music, with father and brother, was it? We're, yeah. we're into music, yeah. is that? How, yeah. How did, yeah, honestly, everybody in my family is super talented when it comes to the music side of things. Uh, um, my dad obviously was the singer in the family, and my mom was uh, very natural at writing short poems and and short stories for kids, children's books, and things like that. So that writing kind of, I guess, stemmed from her, and the music stemmed from my dad. And my brother uh, definitely took on. He's got a band back home too. Some of my old band members are playing for him, and I'm the youngest of four. And uh, 
my sisters both sang in high school and my oldest sister was in the pageants and stuff. So <laughs> it was all about entertainment, right? <laughs> Man, so you've been doing this basically all your life? The, the music side anyways, right? Man, it feels like it. it started at a young age playing the drums and then quickly uh, gravitated towards guitar and piano and things like that and finding instruments that I could carry around easier than a whole you know, truckload of drums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. That makes it difficult. Well, you, yeah. I mean, we we're talking before and you're saying, you know, your, your guitar has basically been your passport and it's taken yeah. you all over. Can you, can you talk about a few of the adventures that your guitar has taken you on? Absolutely, man. Honestly, it's, it started the day I left Nashville or not Nashville, na Nebraska, my little hometown right. of 44 people. And uh, I didn't know a single soul in, in Nashville when I moved and I loaded up my old truck and with what worldly possessions I had and my guitar and I, I moved oh, to town and just started banging on doors and not taking no for an answer and just literally uh, taking advantage of every opportunity that would come my way, you know, and and uh, finally it started kind of picking up with writing circles and things like that. But until I started touring and, and playing out a lot more with big bands and stuff like that and going and meeting some of these people out on the road, they would be find out that I was quickly a, a hunter and outdoorsman that I loved doing whatever. And, and it didn't take long for them to start inviting me to places. And I, I told them straight up, I was like, don't invite me if you don't mean it, because I will show up on your doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you found that background in hunting and fishing, it actually opened doors for you in oh, the music industry? hundred percent, hundred percent. Because I would, uh, I would sing songs and write songs I still do about, you know, growing up in the outdoors and, and loving the outdoors and everything about it. And a lot of these, um, I guess you want to call them high rollers would come to town and I'd be sitting up there on a stool, you know, and, and just playing my heart out and they'd find out and through my stories behind the songs that, you know, I loved, you know, hunting and fishing and, and all that stuff. And they'd come up during breaks and we start talking and that's when they started inviting me to all their hunting adventures. And I'm like, man, this is, this is what's up. This is cool. It's a lot different than <laughs> growing up hunting whitetail and turkey in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> so is that something that was just a family thing that your family would hunt? So you got into hunting? Yeah. yeah. yeah my dad and his brothers um, would go out every opening day for pheasant season and quail. And it, it felt like it was a holiday because it, whether it landed on a school day or not, we were, we were taking that day off, you know, and going awesome. hunting. Awesome. And uh, to this day, they still go out, you know, um, and, and pheasant hunt on opening day and my brother goes with him i haven't had the opportunity to go since i've been in nashville so long um opening day is hard for me to get back to but uh, we're trying to trying to get back to doing some more stuff like that well, i gotta imagine it's gotta be difficult for you to organize your life with all the different things that you're doing i mean just <laughs> looking at some of the charity work that you're doing and some of the yeah. i mean like you do you're singing are you still doing uh performing for the troops is that something you you still do well, I was until COVID, honestly. Right. Um, I was going overseas. I started going over in 2009 to perform for our troops. And uh, we've been to Iraq, Kuwait, Kosovo, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, parts of Egypt, um, Jordan, Niger, Northern Africa, Djibouti. I mean, you name it, we've been there. We even get, had to go to Hawaii. I mean, had to, that's yeah. It. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> and uh, we, we were, I was the first uh, band to go up and tour with for the Coast Guard in Alaska in over 20, I think it was 21, 22 years. Nobody had gone up there to visit the Coast Guard in Alaska because there's <laughs> each little like guard shack has only got anywhere from like two to three or four people, you know. And I was like, man, I want to go up there. And, and the USO jumped on board. So we did a little USO troop tour to, to go hang out with the Coasties in Alaska, which was fun. But man, we've been all over this, this God's great planet of ours and, and seen some stuff that we shouldn't see. But uh, <laughs> being able to go over there and look our service men and women in the eye and tell them thank you on behalf of everybody back here that would love to go over there and say the same thing um, is just a great honor. And, and the cool thing about last night, wrapping it into the opera performance, so every year when I go over to uh, play for our troops, I take, uh, I don't know if I've got one laying around here, backstage passes, all access backstage passes. Right. And as many, I probably take over a thousand of them. And I give them out to all the servicemen and women that I come across. And I say, okay, when you get back to the States, if I'm doing a show near you or wherever you want to come, bring that to the front gate and I'm going to get you in. And one of the guys that I met over there, I think back in 2018 or 19, brought those passes to wow. the Opry last night. And we were like, come on in, you know, it was wow. so cool. You know, it was, it was really cool for that to happen. So those are just some of the things that we love doing while we're over there playing for our troops. 
That's amazing. You, you know, I, I heard a story one time, I think it was about a, a very special microphone. Uh, it might've been attached to an M4. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> well, that was a crazy story, man. Uh, we were, we were over in Afghanistan. It was Iraq. I think pretty sure it was, we were downrange in Afghanistan and we were, we we're everywhere we go, we we're in Blackhawks and we call it fob hopping, which is all the Ford operating bases right. that usually don't get to see inter entertainment. And, you know, it's, it could be anywhere from 150 troops on the ground to less than that. And they're still eating MREs. You never know what we're going to we'll pop into because it's just a guitar on my back and some friends of mine from the, the Western industry that go right. over there. And we're in these two Blackhawks and we had to auto rotate down, but technically crash land in this base that we were not supposed to be at. I believe it was called Camp Stone at the time. And uh, there's so many cool elements that are part of this. I'm going to try and, and condense it as much as I can. But we oh, land. Just tell it. Just tell we it. Land, <laughs> we land at Camp Stone. And the, our, our tour leader, his name is Robbie Powers, who was a uh, re retired Army, and um, went through hell over there, you know so much stuff but uh anyway we land camp stone and he sees this memorial right when we start walking over to the defac which is the dining facility and he starts breaking down just like instantly i'm like mm -hmm. dude what is going on man he's like i don't know how, why we crash landed here or whatever but this camp camp stone was named after his co that was killed in action mm -hmm. when he was over there and he had no idea and really? so Stoney was his name, and they named the whole camp after his CO that w was killed in action over there. Yeah. And um, so that just started small, you know, small world, small world, just kept getting tinier and tinier. Right. And I'm, I'm sitting in the defac, and this guy uh, comes up to me, and he goes, you know, after I do this little show, well, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. But so we go to the defac, we have dinner, we come back out, and they're like, hey, so I see you got a guitar. You want to do a little concert for us? I'm like, yeah, where do you want me to set up? They're like, well, anywhere you want because we don't have stage, we don't have lights, we don't have PA. I'm like, all right. And then this, a bunch of guys start scrambling around. They pull up all the up armored vehicles, the Humvees, the MRAPs, and they kind of do a half moon circle around the defac. And this guy throws a, a pallet down on the, on the ground in the dirt. <laughs> And uh, they find this like makeshift old speaker and they hook it up to the batteries of the Humvee. And this, this soldier literally ejects his uh, magazine and ejects the cartridges out and <clears throat> tapes a microphone on the M4 and he's holding it out there. And that's my microphone stand for the evening. I play probably wow. 45, 30, 45 minutes, whatever. And, and it's just dark and you see silhouettes of all of our, our troops out there with all these up armored vehicles. It's just a cool Amazing. thing. Amazing. Yeah, and then after the performance, this this you know Marine walks out of the shadows and he's coming up to me. He's like, hey man, do you know Steve Holy? I'm like, yeah, I know Steve Holy. And he's like, it's a good friend, whatever. And, and uh, we start a, a quick conversation and, and he's like, man, have you guys got to do anything since you've been downrange over here? And I was like, well, you know, just being over here, hanging out with you guys is, you know, what's cool for us. He's like, no, have you got to do anything cool? And I'm like, like blow stuff up he's like yeah have you blown anything up yet i'm like no oh, yeah. and anyway he was one of the head guys at the the interior base of that base which is a marine special marsoc base as a marine special forces base and he invited us mm. to come out and we loaded up this old truck and all of their ammo and their grenade launchers and <laughs> we just went out <laughs> outside the wire and we're just shooting into the mountains at some of their targets out there and man we just had a blast at Amazing. this place man so it's fun man we've kept in touch with a lot of those guys and and uh, we were able to fly them into vegas and uh for nfr and deck them out in cowboy attire and and just have a great time that's amazing well you when we spoke earlier you're talking about wanting to put a very positive face on hunting and to try yeah. and uh, shape, I don't know if it's reshape the narrative or shape the narrative to correct right. me if I'm out of tune. Out no, of tune you're, here. you're absolutely right. And the, the, when it comes to changing the narrative, it's like, it's, it's hard to do obviously in the industry that we're in to the outsider. Right. Mm. So I'm always trying, I don't, I don't, I try and take the kill shot out of my show mm. just, just because I have a lot of, um, people that are crossing over from my music world to, you know, the outdoor industry, I'm trying to bring my audience over as much as possible. And there's right. a lot of those people that might be turned off to a show where, where they're seeing the kill shot or things like that. So it's just something that I, I felt a desire to do 
personally as well. It's like to honor that animal. I don't always want to show the kill shot um, for that. We'll go right up to it and then we'll see the harvest and you know, it's like we don't hey. necessarily need to see the animal drop or, or suffer in any way, shape, and form. So I try and take that out right away. Right. Um, but the biggest thing is the stigma that a lot of the outsiders of our industry looking in don't understand what we do. So if I can take those little trigger points out as much as possible to where that I can actually break down a barrier to have a conversation with somebody that doesn't understand our industry, to me, that's a win, right? Because totally. a lot of times when we can just have a conversation instead of that person being instantly triggered, oh, you're showing mm. this, you're showing blood, you're showing guts, whatever. I'm like, well, no, that's not what we're about. You know, that's part of the harvest of the mm. animal that we're trying to do. And to be able to have those conversations, it really matters because, I mean, I've had conversations with people that, that were like strictly, had nothing to do with hunting, can't believe you kill animals, all these things like that. I'm like, well, let me tell you why. And right. let me tell you why we are the people that are keeping all of these animals intact so that you can enjoy them as a spectator. Right. Because of us. Right. And so many <laughs> people don't realize that. They don't, man. They that don't. Whole North American model of conservation, which is just founded mm -hmm. around hunters, essentially. Exactly. And organizations like NWTF and Safari Club International and yep. the Mule Bill, all these amazing organizations that, like, if it wasn't for NWTF, there were probably hardly any turkeys in this mm -hmm. country right now because it started, I mean, the numbers when I heard them yesterday were like staggering. They started with like a few thousand and now there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of birds for right, us they're to everywhere. enjoy, you know, because of a hunting organization and hunters protecting these herds. You know, whenever somebody gets into the whole anti-hunting or I'm just not into whatever it might be, uh, talk, mm -hmm. if they are, let's say a vegan, Fair enough. I, I can I can understand their viewpoint, but if they actually eat meat, I always have a very difficult time seeing what oh. the correlation is because Me if too. you're filling your freezer with meat and you're just putting the dirty work onto somebody else or right. you're doing it yourself and it's yep. the enjoyment of the process of being outside, the harvesting of the animal, that pulling of the trigger or mm -hmm. letting loose of the, uh, the, the string on the bow there, yep. that's a fraction of a second of what the exactly. entire process is. Exactly. And that animal had so much a better life living up until that point than any animal that was basically living in captivity to just to be, you know, harvested and then put in a store and sold. It's like this animal had the best life in the world. And now it's having, it's feeding us and it's nourishing our bodies and it's right. strengthening a herd because of its sacrifice. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's compounded conversations that could last forever. <laughs> oh, totally. Totally. And you, you know, know, some of that we're preaching to the choir here, but right. Uh, yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> you know, so, all right. So you came from small town, what's a Hubble, Nebraska, Hubble, Nebraska, over Super to, small. to Nashville, into the big smoke. Right. <laughs> not, not really knowing anybody as you're going in there and you started exactly. swinging a hammer and doing construction work, yeah. which is, I, and I think you were working some maybe temp jobs and trying to find work wherever you could. But the yeah. part that from my perspective, I find really interesting is you said, forget this. Why am I swinging the hammer for other people when it's, I'm, I'm now tied around their schedule. I'm also trying to build this other dream. Why don't I just go ahead and make my, my own business? Yeah. <laughs> is, is that basically how the, how the thought process went? Pretty much, man. I started working for uh, other great contractors in town and thank God I was able to get hired by them because, you know, the stigma of a musician coming to town, a lot of times you can't get hired because of the fact that you're a musician and trying to do the dream right. and all that stuff because they're like, oh, great. He's just going to work for a few weeks and quit, you know, <laughs> but uh, I worked for him as long as I possibly could until it was like, you know what, I, I need to do something bigger and better to to elevate myself so i can get to my next goal and that's right. when i was i was just you know <clears throat> working for a great contractor here i was a superintendent you know i had the company truck and benefits and all that stuff and i met my my now wife at the time and she's like you got to decide whether you came to nashville to uh build houses or build your dream and i was right. like okay i quit now <laughs> <laughs> but it was easy for me to pivot and still have my construction stuff going because i was doing you know my solo stuff with construction and, and doing like remodels and small jobs and things like that to continue to support you know my life actually and and, and build a home actually in nashville that was the hardest thing 
No kidding. So have you have you maintained that construction business as well, or have you just gone? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Yeah. No, I got to a point probably about I want to say ten or fifteen years ago where I was just like. Yeah, I just can't do it all because I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning, work until five o'clock at night, take a quick shower, be you know playing downtown and writing mm-hmm. downtown, doing songwriter nights and recording. And I was like, man, I'm gonna get old really fast. <laughs> if no I keep this kidding. up. No kidding. You know, and uh, thank God because she's an amazing businesswoman as well, and she's uh, just so your great wife. Every, yeah, my wife, Laura Lynn. She has a company called Artistry Alliances that she started in 2020, and it's just taken off like crazy. But um. She does sponsorships and things like that for artists and TV personalities and pro athletes and builds brands together and she's great. Yeah, and, uh, I was looking been, at I was yeah. looking at that website actually. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the in the description Please. as well yeah. as a link to all the things that we've been talking about here. So people who are listening don't have to be jotting it down right away. They can just right. <laughs> click on it either on the podcast or on on YouTube. Cool, thanks, but, man. I mean, you've got a you got a family of of entrepreneurs and it seems like, you know, people will look at somebody who's successful and they'll say, wow, how did they get there? I want, I want that they'll say, and they'll overlook all of the, the five o'clock in the morning and working several jobs and all of the difficulties and everything that you had to give up in order to be able to get to where you are right now. Yeah. And that process in between as well as the process between now and to where you want to see yourself in the future. Those are the two points that really, really interest me. Where a person currently is fair enough, but how did they get there? And what was that pro that that thought process and some of the, the struggles that you had to endure and overcome, because that's, that's something that I think is relatable to absolutely everybody, whether they're, whether their aspiration is, is doesn't matter where it is on, on fortune's wheel or on life's ladder there. Right. So what, what is, uh, that's, that's how, that how would you define tough. your process? Man, my process was literally, it was, uh, survival, honestly, mm. because I knew that Nashville was where I needed to be and wanted to be, um, more than anything in the world. Sorry, I'm going to plug this in. My plug in came undone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want us to crash. And uh, it was literally, it was survival. And I would, you know, holidays would come up and I'd be like, I can't go home. I can't afford to go home. I don't have but $20 in the bank, you know, and uh, my next job mm. doesn't pay out for another two weeks. So it's like, how am I going to stretch this out? Or I just, you know, it was literally, it was survival based. And until those times, and it's, I still sacrifice, you know, moments of, do I get to go home? Should I do Mm. this gig? Should I, what should I do? You know, those kinds of things. So it's just a, it's a matter of prioritizing or organizing your life so that you can be successful in what you do, but still enjoy, you know, life itself because you don't want to just burden yourself with, Oh, I'm going to get this next thing, this next thing, this next thing. Right. At some point you hope to get to that point where you're like, okay, that can go, that can slide because I want to have more quality of life with, family and enjoy them while we're all together still and those kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's a big give and take and struggle, but literally it was sacrifice and, and, uh, survival all the way up until the point where you're like, okay, I can let that, I don't need to do that, but right. go back and do this, you know? So it was just really that kind of thing mentality more than anything. Did you always know in your head that you're going to be successful at anything I, that you put your mind to essentially? I mean, I, I guess I did, but it wasn't like, I just knew that I had to make it su- succeed mm. to get to the next thing, right? Yeah. And uh, whether I crashed and burned, it was like, well, I'll try something else. <laughs> I'll do <laughs> oh. something. I'll pivot here, do that, something. It was just like, this is what I always wanted to do is sing and make music and, and be in the outdoors. And, and uh, thank God it all panned out the way it's, it's looking. <laughs> we're still on I mean, a, we're still on an upward spiral. <laughs> we're still on the journey. You know, people say, uh, and I, and I always, I look at people who would say, oh, I, I would have had a business, but for, or I would have been successful, but for, oh, it was mm-hmm. the, the economy crash back around 08 or it's cause of COVID or whatever sure. it might be. And I don't know if I'm ignorant in my approach, but I've always had the mindset of really, if it is what you want, you will achieve it. Yeah. When, when you achieve that goal and look back, whether the ends justified the means, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, maybe, right. maybe you sacrifice so much to get there, but if it is something you truly want, you will get there. Yep. 
and I and I think, sorry, okay. go on. No, no, continue, continue. Okay, and that's where I when I'm asking, well, like, uh, what does success look like to you? And that's yeah. in, in my thinking, um, if success is based on a final goal, then you're always going to be chasing that next goal in order to be successful. But sure. if it's based on the, on the process, um, then then you'll success will follow you essentially every day. And that seems to be when I look at your career and what you've been doing, man, you just seem to love what you do. Unless you're a really good actor, you seem to absolutely <laughs> love what you do. Trust me. I'm no good at acting. <laughs> I'll leave that to my wife. She's really, she grew up in that world. She's better yeah. at that than I am. But, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a, that give and take thing, man. And I'm, I'm not going to say there's not a ton of bumps and bruises to get started. And along sure. the way, I mean, everybody goes through them and, I've been taken advantage of when I first moved to Nashville a ton, but if you let those kinds of things bring you down, you're never going to do anything. You're just going to recluse into your house and, and, you know, be a hermit and you know, let everybody take advantage of you and let them scare you out of submission. And, sure. and that's just something I wasn't able to do. It's just, I'm like, okay, so you needed that money more than I did. So, okay, you can steal it from me type of thing, you know, right. or you took it, you kind of stepped on me to get to that. Well, I, I, I can't live with myself to do those kinds of things. So you go ahead and do that. And, and that was the thing that I, I prayed about the most was, you know, I wanted to be surrounded by people that were going to elevate me and I could elevate them and, and good people, you know, and that's what right. I still pray about today. It's like, you know, I just want to be surrounded by good people and life is too dang short not to uh, be surrounded with good people and, and love the people that you're around. Mm. So I, I continue to, you know, kind of we pull the weeds out of my life and you have to do that whether whether it's the wrong thing or the right thing you kind of got to pull the weeds that you know those people just bring you down when you're trying to come to them with some some hey i'm really excited about this and yeah and they constantly are like chipping at you <laughs> see right. you later you're gonna pull that weed fast <laughs> you know Good for you. but if somebody can you know at, that you can all support each other on the way up and mm. that's the thing there's so many people that that won't support you or that think that, well, I need, I need that more than you do. Or it's just the people that tear people down, man, there's enough to go around in this world for everybody. Well, you're, so, you're in like, such an industry too, yeah. that you yeah. probably see a whole absolute ton of it. And you know, oh, yeah. I, there is uh what is it? Vaynerchuk. He says, uh, you can have the tallest building. There's two ways to do it by building the tallest building <laughs> or tearing everybody else's down. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> Which one do you want? Yeah, man. Yeah, that, exactly. that process of weeding and picking out through your life and finding positive people to be able to surround yourself with is part of the reason why I started the Silver Core podcast, because Good. the the hunting industry, the firearms industry can be absolutely wrought with uh, negativity and a social yeah. stigma surrounding it, if mm -hmm. that's where you want to put your attention. Right. And I found myself in an area where there was... There was a lot of negativity and there was a lot of, and I was constantly dealing with it and I was, I'm a consulting subject matter expert for a number of different law firms and for, and so obviously the things that come in are going to be negatively based and we'd mm -hmm. post things up on social media and people would be cutting it down and, and I found slowly but surely it kind of starts to shape, uh, your own perspective and your own life. Right. By creating, let's say the Silver Core podcast or by having something like Hogue Wild, where you can surround yourself with positive people who are doing what you're passionate about in the industry. I think that's yeah. one of the ways that I think that's one of the biggest ways that we're able to elevate the industry in general and just yeah. shut that white noise off and all, all the naysayers. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that, man. I completely agree with that philosophy and I'm going to butcher the quote and I'm going to butcher who quoted it, <laughs> but I think it was mother Teresa when she was like, you know, don't invite me to a war rally because I'm not going to show up. But if you invite me to a peace rally, I'm going to be there every single time. I'll be the front one on the lines. Where if you if you promote what you what you want to happen as opposed to promoting the negativity that's happening, it's never right. going to win. You're always going to get more negativity. You're going right. to be promoting that instead of like, I'm going to promote the love and the joy and the fun and the, and the camaraderie and all that stuff. That's what I want. You right. Know? So why wouldn't I be talking about that? <laughs> and absolutely. Talk about it. Surround yourself with it. I, I notice talking with others who are in the film industry or in the music industry. And sometimes I'll, I'll see that people have two different personas. 
And they've got their mm-hmm. public facing persona, their entertaining yep. persona. I think I remember Bear Grylls said he's got uh, a BG and, and Bear, right? And when he's with his family, he's Bear. And when he's out it, uh, doing crazy adventures and eating who knows what, well, that's just BG, right? <laughs> I love that. Do you find that you kind of find the same thing that there's uh, uh, Lucas Hoag and LH? Yeah, I mean, a little bit. I guess when it comes to your family, you kind of let your guard down a lot more because they're family, you know? Mm. And, you know, when you're when you're with on the entertainment side, it's like you have all these kind of barriers up a little bit because you don't want somebody to capture you saying something stupid or <laughs> saying this or something like that. With your family, you say stupid crap all the time, right? Totally, totally. <laughs> you know? And you don't care about it. But, you know, with the, with the way people are recording everything and doing stuff, kind of keep those little barriers around you a little bit when you're out in public so yeah yeah you know, <coughs> excuse me I, 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 you know what COVID. Oh, 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 COVID. oh my god oh oh no <laughs> put a mask on the computer that's right better i catch it through the screen here oh my god I, I, excuse me oh, I, I, i'm sure i'm getting over COVID, even though i tested negative <laughs> oh, rest of my family tested positive so oh man who knows how that works <laughs> Uh, I've actually been asked to speak on a, uh, a live cast tonight on, uh, the current situation over here in Canada with the truck rally. Oh yeah, man. How's that going up there, by the way? It's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. I'm seeing bleed over into the States as well with, uh, with We're supposed to, yeah. I think there's going to be a big truck rally starting here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Where a bunch of truckers here in the States are heading to <clears throat> the capital. So we'll see. I hope so, man. We need something. I, it's I time agree. for us to stand up and fight back. So I agree. You know, it's from a social science experiment. I find it very interesting. Just look, yeah. looking at how people can just, just how human nature is and how people act and how quickly people will capitulate or, or give up rights and freedoms. And it's, yeah. and how scared people can be to actually speak out because of oh, the, yeah. of the social norms. Yeah. I think if it, if there wasn't all the social media platforms, Mm. More people would have spoken out a lot sooner, but you see everything that goes on social media and how people just get bombarded with negativity and just destroyed right. lives because they say one little thing. I think if it was, you know, all that could be delete. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we could have been back to normal a long time ago. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, and I see you on, uh, on TikTok and you're on social media <sighs> there. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. Not because I want to, it's because I have to. to. You got to do it, right? It's if you want to be able to connect to the masses, oh you have to know gosh. how they're talking and what they're talking about, right? Yeah. You try and get one little thing like your music stuff to pop off, you know, and do really good. And it just kind of does this and stays plateau. But then you do some <laughs> stupid video about absolutely nothing. I did a Cobra Kai because I'm a Cobra Kai fan, the karate yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, did a stupid video and that thing popped off. It's like a million, some <laughs> point three million views or something. I don't know what it is. It's insane. I saw that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's so right. Stupid. Oh man. But it's uh, it's funny that's the way how, it is. You know? And it's how it's people just, are communicating. Yeah. You know, I heard something about um what was it? Over here, TikTok is people dancing and doing goofy things. Mm-hmm. And apparently in China, the algorithm rewards people who are inventing things or who are doing something oh. that's uh, uh worthwhile cool. essentially right <laughs> yeah <laughs> what a concept <laughs> I, know. I know get rewarded for doing something worthwhile hmm. yeah. i would have thought <laughs> yeah, that's right is there any dancing in there i ah, forget it. i'm not interested yeah. oh my gosh so with the do you find on uh hog wild do you are you catching heat for being the face of a of a popular hunting show if i am i'm not listening <laughs> <laughs> good you know, I just, I love what I do, and I, I, I uh, want to share it with the world. And, and there's so many people that are like, man, I can't believe you get to go do this. I'm like, you can too. And that's the thing I want to show, because I'll be, I'll be doing some pretty, like, I call it some white glove hunts and okay. some pretty cool things where I'll be like, I'm on a yacht in, in the Virgin Islands, and we have a captain and a chef, but I'm like, they're my friends, so it didn't cost me anything to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just know people in the right places, and yeah. you can do the same thing. And literally, you can rent a yacht, uh, like a four, like a four bedroom yacht in yeah. the Virgin Islands with a captain and a sh- and a crew or chef for a family of four or six for the same price that it would cost you to go to a, like a big theme park here for a weekend. Oh, I tell you where my money's going. I, Thank you. <laughs> right. 
I'd go straight to the blue waters of the Caribbean, baby. <laughs> Hell yes. Hell yes. <clears throat> well, you know, it's not always blue waters. I mean, I, I watched you out in, I think it was Montana there on oh. an elk hunt. Yeah. That man. looked, uh, that looked kind of, uh, interesting. That was crazy. It was supposed to be this like great, you know, hunt and, you know, sleeping in wall tents and that's, I love that stuff. I grew sure. up, you know, hunting hard, you know, yeah. and, uh. It got really hard because as soon as I started driving from Nashville, we got to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and man, the snow and ice started, and I was white knuckling it the whole way. I'm driving a Sprinter van and trailer loaded down because I'm going to be out for like three <laughs> weeks. So I'm like, I got everything I need to yeah. go from the mountains to a bird hunt in Montana and to down do a gator hunt in Louisiana. All so I'm like white knuckling. I see tractor trailers getting turned over in front of me and people just going too fast and spinning out, wow. and I'm like. I'm going like 30 miles an hour, 25. It took yeah. me three days to get from Sioux Falls to Great Falls, Montana. And it should have taken me like a, less than a day to get there. <laughs> and I'm just like, eh, I'm going to, I'm going to survive this. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy uh, concept. And we get there and the snow just, just pounds us. Go from like just a flurry to, what was it? 48 inches of snow over. Yeah. We're, we're packing in and our hip flexors are killing us and. We took three days just sitting in wall tents, chopping wood, just to be able to stay on the mountain. <laughs> That's hard hunting. Damn. Yeah. Well, it was a blast though. I think you're going, you got some crazy African adventures coming up, don't you? Yeah. I leave next Tuesday. Have you been to Africa be, before? I've been to Northern Africa. I've not been to yeah. South Africa. So I'm looking forward to seeing pretty Africa as opposed <laughs> to <clears throat> the not so pretty Africa and North Africa. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. We're going to be there probably the first three or four days and do like just a kind of a shutter bug safari for my wife and I. Yep. And then my camera guys and the crews show up, um, like around the first of what was it, January, February, March. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and, uh, we'll be there till March 11th and, uh, doing planes game and things like that. So yeah, it's gonna be great. That'd be good. I actually and what a lot of people don't know, which I'm going to try and bring to light, is the fact that the hunting industry is what kind of keeps South Africa or Africa in general alive, you know, over there. Right. Fun, it funds a lot. I mean, millions and millions of dollars for the locals over there and for conservation. And what a lot of people don't understand when, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, it's kind of the snowflakes get involved and they're mm -hmm. trying to stop this and that. They don't understand these herds are getting so big over these last two years because none of us hunters have been able to go over to help keep these herds under bay mm. that they're taking over again, you know. And a lot of these really? little tribes are getting ran into with like herds of animals and they're not equipped to hunt like that anymore, you know. Right. They, they really aren't. So it's been devastating on the industry over there. So it's great that they kind of opened the borders back up for us to come back. No kidding. And you're going to try and paint that whole picture and get that, that yeah. information out alongside <clears throat> of the adventure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause we're doing a big rhino conservation piece as well. Okay. So Tam Safari is the one that's bringing us over and, um, they have a, a whole rhino facility on their property where they raise up baby rhinos and put them back out in the wild and they do this protection thing where they actually harvest the horns the you know the, the big horn on the rhino mm. and you know let them grow again and you all that stuff so huh. that they're trying try and take out the whole ivory you know poaching thing so right. it's like okay we've got plenty of ivory all plenty of that stuff on hand no need to go out and just poach these animals if you yes. want it here type of thing and they're so bad. The poaching is just rampant over there. So it's 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 and cool it, to be over there and, and witness all that and help bring the story to light. You know, I did a, a podcast. Actually, I did a couple <coughs> of podcasts. Good friend of mine, Darren Mon. I did one because he was a professional hunter over in Africa. He's a Rhodesian, Zimbabwe individual. Nice. And uh, he's also the bodyguard for, uh, Oprah Winfrey and, and her oh, wow. for some time. Yeah. Some pr right on. Pr pretty crazy stories that he, uh, that he had there too. But, uh, anyways, uh, talking about how the hunting industry really supports Africa and, and the ecosystem mm -hmm. and many of the animals are alive because of the hunting. Absolutely. And, uh, then I get a, a message from him a couple of weeks ago and he says, okay, we're going hunting. We're going to go over to Africa. I'm setting it up. So, yeah. uh, I'll, uh, 
I'm excited. I'm going to see what it's all about, but I'm going to watch your show first to try and get a, some, a bit more <laughs> flavor about it. Maybe right. talk to you afterwards about the, uh, yeah, the do's and don'ts. Me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, my camera guy's been over there like, I don't know, eight or nine times filming for other shows too. So it's really cool to have a native, you know, a veteran guy that's going over there and to film with me as well. So be able to, be able to capitalize on a lot more stuff. So, <clears throat> so what takes priority in your life? Is it going to be your, your music career or is it going to be the, the show? And when I say show, you've done more than one show. I mean, your animal <laughs> conservation show as well. And yeah, I mean, honestly, they go hand in hand. One feeds yeah. the other. Um, because every time I do a, a sh uh, one of my uh, Hogue Wild episodes, I try and tie it in with a, either a concert or some sort of my, a music element. So like when I'm in Africa, I've got a concert over there that I'm doing and raising money for the Amy Bell Foundation, which they build schools for the children over there, um, which is going to be really fun. It's a small little kind of uh, bar in, uh, I want to say, Craddock. Uh, Africa. Okay. Um, so the seating is all like hay bales and stuff. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so much fun. That's Just amazing. made a guitar and we're going to raise some money and hopefully, uh, and do some stuff over there with the Amy, Amy Bell foundation. And, and I kind of try and do that anywhere I go, you know, like when we were just down in Dominican Republic, uh, shooting an episode at Casa de Campo with some good friends of mine, uh, there was another organization down there that I was able to do a concert for while I was there. So it's like, it all kind of happens to to tie in pretty, pretty seamlessly. Isn't it amazing how much you get back when you give? Absolutely, man. Hey, Amen. I started giving back. I mean, my wife was a huge advocate about that from the beginning. Mm. <clears throat> and she started putting me in touch with, uh, we started going down to uh, Mexico to Puerto Varda and uh, I would do a concert on the beach and we'd raise money for this organization called Hook the Cure. And um, it was all benefiting cystic fibrosis. Okay. And, I started doing that. I didn't, we didn't know a soul going down there, but we turned into just, now it's a family reunion, right? Everybody comes back every year for the last 10 years and it's Oral Hershiser and Rick Honeycutt and Matt Young from the Dodgers and, wow. you know, just great people. And we just became really solid friends. And, and now it's like opened up to, well, I have them on as guests, as celebrity guests on my show. They were, they're the ones that went to Dominican with me and it just, you know, it just compounds itself, you know, I, yeah. exactly what you said, give back, you get back. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent of what you get out of life is what you put into it and what you, what you're willing to give out. But I think there's a, I think there can be a, a, a difficult part there for a lot of people. It sounds like you've got that one squared in the giving back. There's going to be a lot of takers out there and being, oh, able, yeah. to, being able to identify where to give your time and mm -hmm. efforts and energy yeah. and who are essentially the vampires who are just going to continue yeah. leeching or sucking from you. Oh um, yeah, man. We get calls every day about organizations. Oh, can you do this? Or can you donate this? And I'm like, <clears throat> I don't, I started out like, I don't have money to give. And that's not the gift that I like to give. I give right. my time. I give my gifts, um, to whatever those can benefit you. I would love to help out. But right. you know, if they're like, Hey, can you give a hundred thousand dollars? I'm like, no, I probably can't. <laughs> you know, that's going to be easy answer. <laughs> I'm going to straightforward with you. If you're asking for money, it's probably not going to happen. But if you need somebody to come help you raise some money, I'll yeah. be happy to do that. You know, those kinds of things. Uh, and I, I can uh, help out that way, but you know, it's, you just have to weed through them and hope that you're doing the right thing for the right organization. You know, you know, people will say, uh, oh, it's it's not personal, it's just business. And I've always been a very, very strong believer that all business is personal. Business yeah. is based on relationships, yeah. which are, are, uh, cultivated over time based on trust and past history. Cause the best perform predictor of future performance is past performance. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, <clears throat> business is very much personal and being able to surround yourself with the people who you can trust and who share the same core values that you do. Yeah. Uh, seems to me anyways, I, I don't have nearly the, the accolades that you do, but within, within my small realm of what I do seems to be the driving force to where I find my success. Would, would you? I'm hundred percent right there with you, man. I always say that you're never really going to hard work your way to the top or to success. You're going to connect your way to it. Right. And, um, you know, that's, that's been my philosophy too. And you try and never burn a bridge and, and you try and make sure that everybody you meet's not a stranger uh, until they make it that way. And, and it's just, you know, that's what it's all about, you know? 
just yeah connecting it. Well, <coughs> excuse me, COVID <laughs> again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> man, yeah, we just got a, um, a new hunting dog. And, nice, uh, man. Yeah, actually, it was uh, not too far from uh, where you grew up. It was in oh, wow. uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Oh yeah, and uh, about three and a half hours. That's I googled it, and I was like, "That's about three and a half hours." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're my wife was going to fly down there, and she uh, ended up having to cancel the ticket and, uh, because she got COVID. Uh, she was fine, d- didn't realize it, and just tested right. positive. But luckily, we we're able to find another family that was picking up dogs and they uh, drove it all the way back to Washington. And once the quarantine was over, it could go down and pick it up. But, uh, That's great. yeah, that was, um, yeah. A- anyways, t- talking about COVID and the, the different effects it has, it looks like in the next couple of months, that's probably most of this COVID stuff's going to be wrapped up. Yeah. I think they're done manipulating this, the masses and they're, I think so. uh, they've slapped us around long enough to where, okay. No more slaps. Well, and that's <laughs> you've had your punches, <laughs> that's, that's a, but I, I think it was a really important thing to happen because I think people needed to be pushed so far in order for the push to kind of come back and uh, yeah, to keep these, you know, for lack of a better word, politicians in line to know that, Hey, we put you in this place we put you in office for a reason mm. until, and then you take advantage of it. Well, we need to get it back. Totally. <laughs> you know. but one, one area where I found that COVID has really helped, and I don't want to take up, I know you're really, really busy there, but. No, uh, no, no, we're good. Okay, good. Is in um, the hunting industry. I found the demand and people wanting to learn how to hunt or to help yeah. be self-sufficient or forage has just, at least in Canada, I found it just skyrocketed. Oh, the outdoor industry here is just <laughs> exploded. Yeah. I mean, you can't keep things on the shelves. Um, you can't find ammo. I mean, yeah. Remington, Remington Ammo is one of my partners, and I have a hard time ordering ammo. <laughs> <laughs> Good for Remington. Uh, yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely, man. And it's just th- those things, and you see a lot of new brands popping up that are already super successful, you know. So it's it's it, it was a good – there are have, have been some cool elements that have happened out of, you know, this craziness. But uh, I wish it didn't have to have happen. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely hear you. Have you found that it's affected, um, uh, the show, at least in viewership, more people wanting to learn essentially. Yeah. The first season, man, was awesome. I think we were like 3.5 million viewers out of the gate, which was really cool <laughs> for a sportsman's channel show. And, um, obviously everybody was in the house and everything was great, but the viewers have been great for season two and really looking forward to season three is going to be the best yet. <clears throat> so we're just having fun and going to keep putting out hopefully great content that people are going to want to see. And, but yeah, I definitely, uh, COVID is, has, uh, given me more time to focus on the show because yeah. I haven't been able to tour as a musician, um, as much because of it, which is a downfall. But, uh, I, like, again, I keep t- trying to tie, uh, concerts into, into episodes as much as I possibly can. So it's amazing. Well, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm conscious of, uh, time constraints here. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that we should be talking about? Man, I don't think so. We covered a lot, man. We, a lot we of good did. stuff. I got ADHD. <laughs> I'm kind of all over the board, but, uh, I am too. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'll be thinking about one thing is like squirrel A. What are we talking about here? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting way to live a life. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there anything that people would be surprised to know about you? I don't know, man. I guess if they've watched Hogue Wild, they'll know that I, I mean, pretty much came from nothing and, and doing what I love to do. And, you know, I'm not the richest guy in the world. I'm not the most famous guy in the world, but man, I just feel like I'm one of the most successful guys in the world because I love what I do day in and day out. And when you, when you have your own business, it's like, it's like what you said, you know, nobody knows what goes on. They just see what, you know, what we put out there. But when you're working for yourself, you get up early and start the work until you go to bed. I mean, it's like, Mm -hmm. Yes. And you never shut it off. I mean, you're never. always working. You're always on the phone. You're always trying to do something, work and deal. So you're working 10 times harder than you ever would have had you had a nine to five job, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but it's so much more rewarding because you're the one, you can make your own schedule, do your own thing. And, and it, 
and builds whatever you want it to build, you know, and that's, that's what I love doing and, and seeing my wife doing it too with her new company is really, really cool and just killing it. And I, I just hope that other people are taking advantage of that too. And I think that's another thing that, that if you want to call it good, that <clears throat> came out of COVID was I think a lot of people, since they didn't have to go to their nine to five, step back and they're like, man, I don't like what I'm doing. I'm going to do something else, right. you know? And so many of my friends have done just that. They're like, I'm going to start my own business or I'm going to figure out how to do this myself and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Congratulations. You know, Yeah. what can I do to help? Or I'm just give you a thumbs up along the way or a slap on the <laughs> ass because good job. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Man, I love that attitude. Absolutely yeah. love that attitude. Well, I'm gonna, like I say, I'm going to be throwing links up. We'll put, uh, we'll yeah. chat a bit off air as well. Anything else we want to kind of throw in, but, uh, cool for the listeners. Check it out. Check out Lucas yeah. Hogue, Hogue Wild, yes. Sportsman Hogue. Channel. Yeah, man. Awesome. There's no D's and no U's in Hogue. It's H-O-G-E. <laughs> <laughs> it's Hogue with an E. Long O. <laughs> Thank so you. I tell everybody. Yeah, that's the easy yeah. way. Every time I looked at it, it was like, Hogue Wild? No, Hogue Wild. Hogue Wild. Sure, <laughs> don't, don't say Hogue Wild. Don't say Hogue Wild. <laughs> I get it more than you can imagine. <laughs> oh, I believe it. I believe it. Thank yeah. you so very much for being on yeah. the silver core podcast i really enjoyed our conversation likewise man thanks for having me on and we need to keep in touch and we'll do this more often 100 percent. 